Welcome back to See You at USC. I'm your Monday night host, Alexia Narcisse, and I am here today with actor, producer, and virtual reality evangelist, Kara Malitsky Sanchez. Stay tuned. We are back with Karen Malitsky Sanchez. For those of you who don't know, this is our VR evangelist. One who spreads the word, knows what they're doing, just someone so brilliant in the world of VR. How are you today? I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me here. Uh, we're excited to have you. Now, I personally would like to know how you came into where you are. So for those of you who don't know, we have two 15 minute segments during the show. And during the first half, I really just want to learn you, everything about you, how you ended up where you are, what's your inspiration, what do you read at night, what do you fear, what do you love? Mm -hmm. So let's start there. Tell me uh, about your upbringing. Sure, I um, was born to a Ecuadorian theater director. Uh, my grandfather was a Peruvian shaman and my father was a Polish lawyer. Um, so right from the beginning, I was in this sort of world of uh, business consideration and avant-garde theater. Um, I wasn't a businessman for a very long time after that. I started in the theater at seven years old doing wow. a, a, a version of Oliver and for a few years I just did theater. Um, Evita, MAME, shows like that. Oh, true theater. Tr yeah, true theater I guess, you know, the great musical theater um, stuff that we love. Uh, and then around 13, I got a job doing CBC radio drama. So radio drama was a place where you are creating entire worlds with nothing but audio and voice. Mm. And you're playing multiple characters and you're, you know, we would have the guy in the, f in the Foley booth right beside us crunching on gravel and like blowing things and uh, making thunder. Um, I'm so grateful that I had that experience. I'm sure all of that now would be done, you know, digitally with samples and, oh, of course. and so on. But there was a real interaction there that I think would end up being quite meaningful to what I did later on in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so after the CBC radio drama, I started a band. Uh, I had oh, always wow. been playing music. My interest in, in music came from both the theater and the fact that I went to a special kind of private music school that I got whisked away to, like a Hogwarts. <laughs> I was happily having a normal childhood, and then one day these uh, nuns descended upon my school, and they picked two kids out of each class. Now, I wasn't a well-behaved kid. I was well-meaning, but I okay. wouldn't say I was like the, like the model student. Um, but I was doing theater, so they thought, well, he should go to this audition. Okay. Hmm. So they whisked me downtown and there was this room of all of these boys that had been picked, you know, it was a boys uh, music school. So they were handpicked basically. Yeah, yeah, and they were all, it was like. You're making this sound too humble. This sounds top tier. It, well, I suppose in a way it was <laughs> okay. a, quite an extraordinary place to be. I mean, who, yeah, who does like two hours of choral training and then there's like organ playing and piano. Wow. But, the, but I was too young to understand that that was unique or weird. And it was also in the mm. middle of downtown Toronto in a really kind of sketchy area. Mm. So there was this dichotomy between this pious private school and then um, a lot of homeless people, a lot of people on drugs, a lot of like really <sighs> volatile situations. It's real art. Right it was quite a, quite a contrast. Um, and I think that also informed a lot of like who I became because it wasn't that I was coddled in this like little private school. I was seeing the actual real world and then going into this very controlled setting. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it sort of afforded me this way of being a bit of a skeptic or understanding that there's maybe two or three sides to every situation. Um, and and so I started a band around that point. I met some cool friends. It was like the, you know, the dawn of my adolescent years. And that band became quite avant-garde. Uh, we, we tried to shake things up a lot. This is way back in 1992. 
Um, it was kind of a cross between like Frank Zappa and the Sex Pistols and I was doing a lot of weird uh, kind of avant-garde theater while being in this it. band. Um, and that grew for a couple of years. I put up uh, records out and, and learned what it meant to run a record label mm -hmm. um, and what it meant to go against the establishment and how to be a DIY person and uh, how to attract an audience but not compromise the intention of the message. Mm -hmm. um, and so one day I got an audition. I had just finished doing a show the night before. It was a crazy show. This is in the days of like early Nirvana and um, oh, that's real. You know, um, suicidal tendencies, and there was you anything kind of goes type time. Um, in fact, I used to think Nirvana was too mainstream back <laughs> then. So uh, we played this show, and I was covered in mascara, and I had crazy hair, and I was <laughs> these big boots and uh, green nail polish, and and my agent called me and said, "You have an audition tomorrow morning for this show about a bunch of kids." trying to make it as an R&B band downtown. And I thought, oh God, okay, I'll go, but I'm no shape. <laughs> and so I went in and there was, you know, uh, a, a dance bar and there was ballerinas like stretching and like muscle guys and Sounds opera like singers. Movie. It was, it was like walking into like a chorus line or, or um, uh, one of those, I, whatever, you know, <laughs> a voice or something. And, and I looked around and thought, I'm so not ready. I'm not qualified. I have no idea what's going on. And I went into the room and they took one look at me and they said, like, what are you going to do for us today? I said, I'm going to, I didn't have any sheet music. I said, I'm going to sing Terrence Trent Darby a cappella. Is that good? She said, you <laughs> just do what you're going to do. And, and I just kind of like flubbed my way through it. Um, but they just thought it was so dyed in the wool and so unexpected that somehow they gave me the job. Oh, that's excellent. So for two years, I shot this series called Catwalk um, with a young Nev Campbell and um, an actor named Paul Popowich. And I think that was her first show, actually. I think that was her first series before she went off and did a Party of Five. So here we are in 1992 in this big warehouse trying to be CNC Music Factory or or um, the Commitments or something. And there's no internet yet. The internet wouldn't be around for another two years. Mm, okay. Um, and, and then they were, you know, trying to push us to do these record deals with MGM or MCA or whatever it was at the time. Uh, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to sign a big deal because I had a real life band and mm -hmm. this whole notion of TV kind of upset me like this controlling your life thing. So eventually I kind of made my way off of the show and uh, moved to LA through a very long story. But I didn't come to LA to act. I came to LA to sort of follow somebody who I was trying to produce a record with and we were developing this album. Um, and while I was here, uh, Nev said, why don't you go meet my manager and see if you can go out on an audition or two? And I did. And the first thing I went in on was a project called American History X. Mm, OK. I know what this is. You have heard of it? Yes, I have. OK. So I thought, oh my gosh, this script is dangerous. I don't know what to do about <laughs> it. If this is Because it wasn't any. It was written by you know an unknown author, really, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it was going to be at New Line. And I thought, if this movie isn't done responsibly this could be worse than what it's trying to criticize no I have to ask a quick question sure uh, from an actor's perspective when you're choosing films for yourself are you thinking of I'm just wondering as an actor are you thinking of this could be the end of my career or this could be something in my Rolodex that I don't want there that I don't want people looking at on my IMVD page yeah absolutely it, okay it is so um, you're choosing selectively I mean some people might not some people are just really happy and they as they should be are happy to get any kind of job or audition mm -hmm. um, I've always been what my therapist calls a mythic thinker I just think in terms of the giant arc and not the mm -hmm. short term it's why I never took one of the many jobs I should have taken like to be a waiter or to work at um, a local Mr. Mail because I felt like if I had a fallback, then I would not have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so I made it so that my back was up against the wall and no matter what happened, I had to fight my way out of the problem. Um, so 
So for me, but even then, even when I was starving to death, I would, I was never starving to death, but even <laughs> when it was like that, um, I, I felt like the integrity is going to ultimately be more important than anything that I choose in the short term. And that when mm. I die, I leave back behind that series of choices. A real legacy. Almost. Yeah. And, it, and it's not even for the sake of seeming, you know, like I'm cool or like I made good choices because sometimes terrible films end up being wonderful choices. <laughs> um, I, some of my favorite films are B movies and cult films and, you know, Roger Corman and all of those guys taught us so much. So it's not that that I can possibly predict. I couldn't predict whether American History X would be a good movie or a bad one. And there are films that I got on that were like incredible Hollywood productions with well-established actors that were terrible mm -hmm. films. So I can't pretend to know that, but I certainly consider, do I want to um, subscribe to this idea just because it's gonna be famous um, versus something that I think is more yeah, it's, it's sort of painting a picture of like what legacy do I want to leave behind. Okay, so you were saying American History X. Right. You, you had just gotten uh, audition or script. You were. I ready got an for audition. Okay. I went into the room. I read the um, the the sides in front of director or producer Tony Morrissey uh, and and uh, Adam. Uh, no, not Adam. Tony K. And this is what happened. Tony K stops me in the middle of my read and he says, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> and he says, no, you, you got it. You, you nailed it. You got this job. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, you got the job. And Tony, uh, uh, Morrissey, John Morrissey, the producer who had just done Forrest Gump looks over him like, what are you doing? <laughs> and so I leave and he says, yeah, yeah, we'll, we're going to work some stuff out. And, and that's that. And so oh, I wow. leave and I'm thinking, this is a, this is, this is my first Hollywood audition ever. So I'm thinking, this is really strange. Now, the, the lead actor at the time was Ed Norton, and he remained the lead actor, um, and I was to play his brother. So I went home, and my manager said, how did it go? I said, well, he told me I had the job in the room. Is that normal? Is this okay? And, and she said, no, that's not normal. I'm not sure what you're talking about. And that was the, the, he just thought that I had the quality that they wanted. And, um, and then what ended up happening was that I was, n they needed a bigger name. Ed Norton was a, was not a big enough name at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they decided to get the kid from uh, Terminator to Eddie uh, Furlong okay. yes. to come in and bring some star power. Um, and so I ended up playing his best friend. But anyways, the thing about that was that it got me my visa and I had such an interesting start in Hollywood. I mean, that was an, an incredibly no intense one has a story like that. movie to make. They were shooting yeah. a million and a half feet of footage on celluloid and he would just roll out the camera. He would just roll and then we would just improvise until the film ran out. So everything that I've done feels like it has been like a really outside kind of version of the reality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, f and so anyways, 20 years later, I'm still in Hollywood. I've had a series of experiences that I'm not sure I could ever publish, but, but I've held on and, and I um, eventually got into what is the nature of storytelling? What are we really doing here? Okay. And what's this all for? So when we get back from this break, I want to talk more about that reality that you're speaking of, that storytelling that you're speaking of, and the way that you have really been a key influencer in what that form of, I, I don't even want to say transportation, but what that device is using to send that message and to create those stories. So we'll be right back after this break. Stay tuned. We are back on Monday night at CU at USC, and I am here with Karen Malitsky Sanchez. We just finished talking a bit about his life, uh, basically your upbringing, how you have developed as an individual. And now what we're going to do is touch a bit on uh, storytelling and how he has been able to transform the world of storytelling and how we internalize that information and how it's put out to the world. So let's start with that. What do you foresee the future of storytelling being? because I understand in your lifetime you've experienced acting, directing, so you've been on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but that platform is changing drastically with the internet and the new the devices that we have, the electronics, the technology. So where do you see that going? Right, so um, once the internet came around, um, things started to change rapidly and we started to tell stories 
ourselves, we started to write to each other in different ways. It wasn't a letter, it wasn't thought out. It was kind of like an asynchronous relationship between each other. There was this anonymity wall, but there was also a real, like a real time um, mm. thing going on. And then 20 years of that happened and we sort of have figured out where we are. We're lost in this like Facebook funnel and <laughs> social <laughs> media is creating these like rapid proxies for like what we really think. We barely get beyond the headline. Um, it's kind of in need of a desperate shakeup. So just to connect this to the first part, around 10 years ago, I felt like the indie music scene was just over. Like it was so appropriated. There was no real charge left to it. And I wanted to find out where was that new kind of punk rock place that you could go and, and sort of stay outside of the lines and really get a better sense of what was really going on outside the media dome. And I felt that independent video games which were becoming more and more easy to make and more accessible, were where the new stories were emerging. And you're saying independent is in like a PlayStation, like the individual, like the games or I'm the- I'm talking independent, meaning you're not at a AAA studio that's ah, you know spending $23 okay. million dollars on a game. And its only concern is to like reach mass adoption. Okay. Um, I'm talking about indie games that were not made for the money, that they thought they were never gonna make a dollar back, so why are they doing it? Because they need to tell some kind of a story or to share some kind of a world with you that they're, they have locked inside. Mm -hmm. And that medium became extremely potent for um, groups that are typically you know, not heard or that are marginalized or whatever the case may be. And so you had whatever example of that, um, you had those people at home being, you know, taking off the shelf tools and making these unique stories. And eventually, uh, just to super fast forward, over the course of 10 years, the indie game world had a bit of a golden age. It went from like, you know, 8 bit DDD kind of stuff to complex and very intimate and personal stories um, that kept maturing and maturing substantially into its own thing. And eventually, um, the, the game part of it started to fall to the to the wayside in some mm. cases and you got the emergence of things that are sort of ad hoc named walking simulators games like dear esther and gone home and amnesia were these new sorts of poetry that people were walking you through inside of these constructed worlds and if you think about it um, with a game engine, you mm -hmm. can create all the sets and all of the lighting and all of the nuance that might be otherwise prohibitive because of cost. As the graphic engines became more advanced, people were able to go even further into like the modders and the hackers were reverse engineering game engines and were building stories. And you had the machinima movement, which is where people were overdubbing, you know, their playthroughs and like having their characters talk to each other. Oh, wow. Okay. And so... So something was like hitting the ceiling and trying to break out desperately. Um, then you cut to 2013 where the story goes, this kid named Palmer Lucky in Long Beach started a Kickstarter and said, I believe that VR can really work again. And they said, nah, that died 20 years ago. And he said, no, I really think if you tape one of these modern phones to your face, uh -huh. we could figure out a way to like immerse ourselves. Whatever the reality of that story is, uh, the fact is he started a Kickstarter, asked for $250,000, got $2.5 million, and then a year later Facebook bought it for $2.6 billion. <sighs> and so... And that's overnight in the yeah, world, pretty world much. of tech and I mean, now there business. was a big case about it and Zenimax sued Oculus and whatever, but the point is that in 2013, the... Uh, developer kit one of the oculus rift became available and i got one I, a friend came over with one at my house and i put it on and i watched a basic demo of this roller coaster ride and i'd never in my life experienced something so instantly visceral and terrifying and overwhelming and that was like a 640 by 480 resolution like <laughs> never mind the hd version I put my grandfather through it. He was about 89 at the time, the Peruvian shaman I told you about. <laughs> he used to fly Cessna planes in the Amazon. And I thought, oh God, this might be a little too much for him. And he was like, what? <laughs> Just freaking Just out. Just living for it. Yeah, yeah, he was, I mean, he, he was fully subscribed. And uh, that told me a lot of things right there at that moment. It said, what does that mean for a feeble old guy who has all of his mental faculties about him, but he can't get out of the house? What does it mean for him to have access to a tool like that? 
What does it mean for me to be instantly physiologically overwhelmed by this experience? Mm. So uh, within 12 months, I had started VRTO, which is the Virtual Reality Toronto meetup, because I was born in Toronto. And at the same time, the Five R's Festival, the festival of international, virtual, and augmented reality stories. It's a lot easier to say five R's. Good Lord. So you would put, were both <laughs> of these going simultaneously? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were two separate things. The VRTO meetup was basically, and there were meetups in town, and they were good meetups, but they were fairly um, the standard kind of meetup where you get a bunch of beer and you hang out with a bunch of people who have computers and you share stuff. And I thought, okay, that's good. I think we also need something else. I think we need to turn it out of the silo and mm -hmm. reach out to other communities and people that are driving taxis and mothers that are watching their kids and say like how do you participate in this now not mm -hmm. later how do we get over the exclusivity and that sort of techno um barrier yes you know that even 20 years later even though my mom knows how to use everything she still says i don't understand this email thing <laughs> so but what if you do believe that you understand it what if yes. you do use this and communicate through it just, just to make a point, tomorrow, which is the 12th of April 2017, at the time I'm saying this, my grandfather, who's 92, and my grandmother, who's 90, who've been together for 60 years, are going in to be scanned digitally by a company called Quantum Capture. And it'll create wow. a 10 million polygon model of them down to the hair follicle that will be preserved forever. This mesh will be available. I would far rather preserve their frame, their face, all of the constructs of their body, um, and the, the character in, in a lifetime lived, mm -hmm. then stick them in a vat of cryogenic goop. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't know what the ethics are, but I do concern myself with those ethics. And so when we launched the VRTO World Conference, the first thing I said is, listen, this is extremely potent media that we are about to un leash to the world to the world and to send this out into the suburbs because the product may be popular without really understanding what neurological psychological impact this can have it's it dangerous it's like shipping cartons of cigarettes out and saying smoke up johnny you're going to be awesome mm -hmm. um i feel in very short periods of exposure to virtual reality, the palpable effects. Mm. Um, so there has to be some kind of conversation about ethics and accountability and responsibility and in using it yeah. so that we can then, with great confidence, move forward. So you created the platform essentially for that to take place on. Right. And I, I think that, I mean, one of them, right? But I think that like at the beginning of the internet when you had the Electronic Frontier Foundation and all of these advocates for an open internet and a private internet and one that protected you and allowed you to have the freedom to speak. Um, if that hadn't been there, what would our fallback be for the internet? It mm. would be, well, the military gave us this thing that we can communicate through and they can kind of watch us and <laughs> now that there are paywalls, you know, who knows what it's for. Yes. But because that was inserted at the very beginning, our fallback for how we perceive the internet is it should be a free place, as mm. in free as in um, open source and free as in beer. And it should be, um, well, and it should be uh, neutral and it should allow, afford us that privacy. So I think that we have to put the same thing into the VR spectrum and because it will be abused yes. invariably. From what I can understand about VR, it, it has, in the sense of, of how far it's come thus far in this short period of time, it really has been something that is so accessible. I mean, I've seen people use the cardboard VR boards, and I've also seen people use the full plastic wear. Right. But uh, to shortly jump off subject, I want you to quickly touch on what people can do to become involved in VR and what kind of devices they can use. Awesome. So right now, you can use an incredibly powerful development tool like Unity which is cross-platform, which means... And that's to create, Right, correct? so you can go into a game engine, and it's a 3D... Basically, here's how simple it is for people who have no idea what programming or anything is. You download free software okay. called Unity. They have a little asset store, like the iTunes App Store, and you say, wow, here's a bunch of models of robots. And they download, and you just drag them in, uh -huh. and 
you install Google's free um, uh, software development kit. You click install, and then it says here, drag this object into the scene. That object is packed with code that will mean if you hit play and you put on a head-mounted display, you're already in VR. Wow. And I'm looking at the robots that I just dragged in, and I'm feeling the size of the robots. And if I place any uh, virtual lights or I put textures on the walls or I create volumetric fog or whatever, I'm going to feel a cinematic effect start to emerge, which I can now move around and go back and, and forth between that reality. So for people that want to become involved in that type of reality, want to be involved in the future, because this clearly is the future of how we consume stories, media, essentially everything soon, how can they become involved? Um, here, I'm going to show you something. This is a, there's two, there's a definition I want to make. One is that virtual reality is when you use a game engine and you can manipulate objects inside of that world because they're being created by the computer. The other kind, and I make this distinction, is spherical video. Okay. Now, it's not VR. It's an immersive medium. Um, it has a long history. And basically, this little camera, which is 350 bucks, called the Ricoh Theta. I put a little rubber yellow thing so I don't lose it. Um, so this thing can shoot 360 video or 360 photos. Okay. And this is the kind of stuff they put into war zones or into you know unusual environments you may not be in. Or to experience it, to experience it. So if people want to buy the Ricoh Theta, they can find that online. If they want to find you online, where do we find you? Um, so uh, I would be on Twitter at K Malitsky Sanchez. Uh, VRTO is on VR Toronto. Okay. And 5Rs is at 5Rs Stories. Perfect. And those are all places where we're constantly putting out information and news and ideas about <laughs> all, of, uh, all of the VR, all of the VR medium. medium. So I've got to thank you guys for tuning in today. Please check out these websites. Go online. Become involved. This is a part of our future, and Karen Malitsky Sanchez is writing the future. We'll see you guys next week. TrojanVision.com and like us on Facebook.